good afternoon everyone itech india welcomes all the participants for today's ndls session today's topic is provision of second and third line ard among adults and adolescents and the speaker is dr priya patel dr priya patel ma'am is an associate professor with the department of medicine at grand government medical college and sir jj group of hospitals baikala mumbai she is also the deputy program director of the center of excellence in hiv care and the alternate nodal officer for both the artcs at jj hospital mumbai she has done many thesis studies on hiv out of which five have been published she has also done a study at icmr on oi profile in hiv we welcome you ma'am for today's session and request you to start the session Uh, ma'am should i share the screen from my end requesting participants to kindly bear with us oh Pravin sir, uh, ma'am has logged in with my name. Can you please make her co-host again? Yes, that is done. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Dr. Priya, ma'am, can you please try to share your screen again? Uh, please switch to full screen mode. Screen is visible, ma'am. Thank you so much, yeah. ma'am. Yeah. You can start the session. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So today's topic is uh, provision of second and third line ART among adults and adolescents. Yeah. So the objectives, session objectives we are going to discuss today are. regarding art treatment failure then regarding the viral load testing protocols and adherence support the treatment failure to first line and second line art so we are also going to discuss the new viral load testing protocol as per the recent om in uh, may then uh, second line art failure and third line art and regarding the drug drug interactions with key arv drugs so coming to the treatment of failure what is the definition so basically a failure is loss of antiviral efficacy and it triggers the switch of the entire first line regimen to the second line or beyond and it is suspected by immunological and or clinical indicators but needs the confirmation of unsuppressed viral load and before identifying treatment failure certain factors like art duration new oi or iris and treatment adherence must be considered so one of the most important factor before we label an unsuppressed viral load as treatment failure is the treatment adherence because non adherence to treatment will also lead to unsuppressed viral load and that is not actually failure so defining treatment failure now virological failure is defined as a plasma viral load of more than 1000 copies per ml at or after 6 months of art with more than 95% treatment adherence so if the plasma viral load is more than 1000 copies per ml with poor adherence that is which is less than uh, 95% then it may not be virological failure then coming to immunological failure the cd4 count at 250 cells following clinical failure or a persistent cd4 cell count below 100 and clinical failure is a scenario where there is new or recurrent clinical event like say tb pcp pneumonia or any oi indicating severe immune immunodeficiency that is who clinical stage 4 condition after 6 months of effective treatment so patient has taken more than 6 months art and now he is developing an infection like disseminated tb or any stage 4 who clinical condition so that will be clinical failure now coming to viral load testing so plasma viral load testing is recommended as the preferred monitor to monitoring tool to assess art response and identify and confirm treatment failure so for plhiv who are on first line art 
the timing of viral load test will be it should be done at 6 months and 12 months after art initiation and thereafter annually every yearly for plhiv on second line art viral load testing should be done every 6 months after initiation of second or third line art and for all plhiv transi transition that is either there is a switch to a further line second line or third line or there is a substitution of a drug then for them at 6 months 12 months and then annually so this is for patients on first line and for patients on second and third line it should be every 6 months so plasma viral load testing is recommended for all hiv positive pregnant women during 32 to 36 weeks of pregnancy regardless of the duration of art which is important to do because we determine the risk of hiv transmission to the baby so that is why at the uh, at the gestational age of 32 to 36 weeks all HIV positive pregnant women should undergo a, a viral load testing. Now, why we uh, do viral load as a marker for uh, failure? So, this uh, slide is showing the chronology and uh, the timing of different uh, indicators of failure. So, you can see here uh, the treatment when the treatment failure develops, that is, the virus becomes resistant. The earliest marker is the viral load. So you have seen here that the whenever now the virus has become resistant and so there is treatment failure. So now the viral load starts rising. So the first marker is viral load and there is a increase uh, viral load that is unsuppressed viremia. And after that, once the viral load builds up and becomes very high at that time, so the CD4 is still normal and it is still maintained. And now when the <clears throat> viral load is very high, the CD4 starts following. So there is a lot of lag. You can see so much of lag between the immunological failure, that is low CD4 count and virological failure. So there is a time which has gone. And so once the patient has resistant virus and lot of time has passed between detection of that failure, then those resistant mutations will increase, will go on increasing. So now here there is a, we pick up much later the <coughs> immunological failure. And then the patient remains asymptomatic for a long, large, for very long duration until the CD4 has fallen to a large extent and that time you will develop OI and that is the clinical failure. So you can see that uh, virological failure comes the most earliest. So it provides an early and more accurate indication of treatment failure and the need to switch to second line drug. So by virological failure, we immediately can promptly switch the entire regimen so the resistant mutations do not increase over a period of time. So this helps to reduce the accumulation of drug resistance mutations and improves the clinical outcomes of PLHIV on ART. And measuring viral load can also help distinguish between treatment failure and non-adherence. So when we do the uh, viral load testing and find out that the viral load is increased, then we definitely we ask the history of adherence and then sometimes it, uh, it is found out that the patient is not adherent and we can promptly again do the proper adherence counseling so that it will in, uh, improve the clinical outcome. Now, this is the viral load uh, testing protocol among PLHIV. So, this is under NACP. So, this is the OM dated 2nd May 2024. So, you can see that uh, we conduct a viral load testing at the scheduled duration. And now the viral load, say for example, a patient is on first line ART and now after six months, we have conducted a viral load. Now the viral load count is more than 1000 copies per ml. At that time, the counselor will provide enhanced adherence counseling of, uh, to the patient for three months. And this is EAC1. So this is the first enhanced adherence counseling and every monthly. So first the EAC is done and it is done every monthly for the next three months. Then, if adherence in last three months is more than 95%, so at the end of the first EAC, it is found that the adherence is now optimal. It is more than 95% in last three months. Then a viral load testing is done. And if the viral load count is suppressed, less than 1,000, the same ART regimen is continued. However, 
if the viral load is now more, still more than 1000, then there is a e-referral to SASEP for further evaluation. Now, suppose at the end of EAC, first EAC, at the uh, three months, the adherence is still not uh, become more than 95% and still adherence is poor, that is, it is less than 95%, then we have to provide a second EAC. So, provide EAC, that is the EAC 2, to the patient for three months again through a different counselor under the supervision of the medical officer. And then again, we conduct a viral load testing. At the end of this second EAC, a viral load testing is done irrespective of the adherence level. So, whatever now the adherence has achieved, we do a viral load testing again. Now, suppose the viral load is more than 1000, then we do a e-referral to SASEP. If the viral load is now suppressed, we continue the same regimen. And at the end of schedule duration, if the viral load is suppressed, then the same regimen is continuous. Now, when we are doing EAC, so EAC should not be just on paper. Now, uh, at JJCOE, we get a lot of e-referrals. And it is mentioned in that form that adherence is more than 95% EAC. It's all mentioned. But then when we are actually calling the patients for uh, at the, for actual success, because we want to cross check, when patients are, especially when patients are failing on the first line DTG regimen, which is a very robust regimen, we are now calling the patients to the COE. And we found that most of these patients, though it, is, it was mentioned by the counselors as adherence uh, more than 95%, the adherence was poor. So, EAC should not be just on paper that we are just writing that it's just more than 95%. Actually, you have to do EAC properly. I'll be showing you the different forms. So, barriers of poor adherence should be, the, what is the purpose of enhanced adherence counseling is we have to identify the barriers of poor adherence. And these should be addressed. So, whatever the barriers are there, they should be addressed during EAC by the counselor under the supervision of SMO or MOART. So, the involvement of SMO or MO has to be ensured right from the beginning of EAC. So, the MO, it's not just that it is to be done by the counselor. The MO or the SMO right from the beginning of EAC has to look, EAC has to look into the issue such as any clinical condition, concomitant medication and partial adherence. And the counselor should ensure regular follow-up of such patients to ensure adherence on ART. And PLHIV undergoing EAC2 should be rigorously followed by the ART counselor through phone calls and also seek support of CAC for follow-up of such cases to ensure treatment uh, adherence. And SASEP is expected to look into and understand the reasons for poor adherence or any other clinical reason. So, now, when we are calling the patients for actual SASEP, that time again we are uh, doing EAC by the counselor of our, our ART center and we find out many barriers and that time then these barriers are addressed and again uh, EAC is done and uh, the corresponding ART center is communicated that the adherence is not poor, uh, good, the poor adherence and we continue the EAC. So, that's how the... Uh, thing goes. And one more thing, now we found, we said that viral load is used for identifying treatment failure, but that is, that is only for HIV 1. For HIV 2, uh, the viral load is not available uh, in our NACO protocol still. And so for HIV 2, we are doing detection of uh, failure by immunological failure only. So this applies only for HIV 1. And identifying treatment failure for HIV-2 is by uh, CD4 count. Now, coming to the step-up adherence counseling form. So, this is a very comprehensive, very nice form. Only thing it should be properly followed by the uh, AR center. So, you can see here, has to be written. So, now for our... Uh, SASEP of JJCOE, we are, when they when it is written that uh, adherence is more than 95% and at the end of three months still the viral load is high, we ask for the uh, scanned photographs of these step-up adherence counseling forms so that we can 
find out ki what are the actual barriers what, what is it actually written and when we many times when we ask for such forms the ert center is uh, center has not provided these forms that means it is not followed so i it is my uh, really sincere request to all the medical officers and all counselors that this form step up adherence counseling form you actually uh, document everything in that what are the barriers what are the interventions so and the same counselor who has done the session 1 he will be able to properly follow up that whether whatever suggestions were given whatever the interventions were there are they followed in session 2 and session 3 so this mentions the art num number the regimen date of art initiation date of viral load viral, viral load result and due date for next all these details are to be filled name of the counselor is mentioned date and art adherence last 3 months again does the patient have adequate knowledge about so this is the first thing which is mentioned here so that you have to find out whether the patient knows the importance of art adherence so whether he has knowledge about art art adherence and what are the risks of poor adherence if the answer is no then it is the duty of the counselor to explain that to the patient then whether the patient knows about the viral or result yes or no if the answer is no then again the counselor or the medical officer should explain whether the art drug dosage that is number of pills and timing is properly followed if he knows that because i remember one patient in our sasep when we had actually called the patient we realized that the patient was not taking uh, zl in bd dose so he was patient was taking she was a female patient she was taking zl only od and she said that i asked many i asked the medical officer i asked the pharmacist but nobody was telling me how to take the tablets so this was actually we found out during our uh, interview the counselor found out that she is not taking the tab tablets because she didn't have the proper knowledge so again it is the duty of the team the medical officer or the pharmacist to explain how to take the drugs and when the patient is not adherent uh, we have to actually find out we have to show the pills and tell them that ask them how they are taking so we'll know that whether they are taking properly and what time then what is the support system to the patient that also we should it should be documented in this form name and relation of the caregiver address and phone number of caregiver so that we can cross check later on and ask the caregiver whether the patient is adherent or not then different barriers now every patient will have different reasons for not taking so there may be that the patient forgot or patient may be having some physical illness during that time so could not take social functions fear of disclosure so i remember that there was a young married female they had not disclosed to their in laws and so she was not able to take it in front of the in laws so they, these are the different issues so whatever the barrier is there we have to find out long wait then believe substance abuse the patient feels that i am healthy and i don't no longer i need it then adolescent uh, patients have different again issues they are rebels so they throw the tablets from the windows you know they they tell that we take but many adolescents i have found this that they uh, want to you know they don't like taking these tablets because of the peer pressure and you know they feel uh, a stigma so whatever it is they will not take the tablets so it is very very important uh, that this barrier is found out and we document that barrier sometimes it is the pill burden there are so many different pills patient is concomitantly taking the uh, cotrimoxazole prophylaxis and uh, there is inh prophylaxis maybe so patient feels nausea vomiting then there are so many drugs so there may be gastritis and so patient you know uh, stops the art and continues the uh, inh coprophylaxis and the cotrimoxazole pill because patient doesn't understand so one of the uh, the most important art drug is dropped and patient continues to taking the other pills so whenever there is the pill burden is high even with minimal uh, pill burden like uh, tld1 od once daily first line regimen still the pill burden may increase because patient is on uh, the different prophylaxis regimens so we have to explain that which is the most important and uh, what is the importance of all these tablets so once the barrier is found and it is documented then we have to do the counseling regarding so suppose the office timing patient is having some stigma issues and uh, 
ART timing is coinciding with his office going timing. We have to change the timing. We have to give them solutions for this. Uh, any any issues which the patient is uh, facing. Suppose it is because of the adverse effect of the drug. Then the counselor has to uh, inti uh, intimidate the MO that this is the uh, uh, adverse effect and because of which the patient is not taking the drugs. And it may be sometimes vomiting, it may need tenofovir, AKI, it can be uh, pancreatitis because of the NRTI. So prompt uh, recognition of that adverse effect and changing the regimen through SASEP will again ensure proper adherence. But we can just do plain counseling that you, you should take, you should take, even if you are having side effects, you continue taking. Patient is not going to continue that. So even if, if, if the uh, lack of adherence, whenever it is because of drug adverse effect, it is very important to identify what side effect, what has adverse effect and uh, take proper steps to diagnose what is the condition. Sometimes it is tenofovir induced bone toxicity. Patient is having severe bone pain and um, um, patient cannot walk also. And still the regimen is not changed. It is the issue is not addressed in the concerned ART. So that should not happen. So whatever the interventions that have to be taken and the instructions. So suppose patient is forgetting, our counselors are suggesting alarms. They help the patient set an alarm in the mobile or the calendar is given and the patient is asked to tick mark in that or there is some SMS system you know, provided. So all that. So now when the patient comes in the session two, now the same counselor is now uh, facing the patient. So he knows what were the issues last time. He has documented them and then now he asks. So in that follow-up of session one, he will again ask what is the adherence. He will calculate the adherence and if he will appreciate if the adherence is more than 95%. Now for TLD regimen, once daily regimen, the adherence is more than 95% if he has forget, forgotten only one or two pills. So not more than that is allowed to forget. So hardly, so, so more than 95% means he has taken out of, in a month of 30 days, 28 times he has taken the pill. Only one or two pills may be forgotten. That is adherence of more than 95%. So if it is there, then we need to appreciate that and he has to be motivated to maintain the same. So yes or no. Again, it is documented over here that adherence is more than 95% or no. And the comments. And where the strategy is discussed in the session one implemented, if not, why? So whatever suggestion intervention was done, whether it was implemented, implemented by the patient. If it was not implemented, then uh, again find out the reason why is not implemented and again uh, find out what is the barrier, uh, why still the adherence is not there and what is the intervention. So many times in the SASEP reference, they just write that the adherence is poor, we are doing repeated counseling. But repeated counseling should lead to proper adherence. So that is why these barriers have to be addressed and some intervention regarding that particular problem of the patient has to be solved. So same thing in session three. Again, if the adherence is more than 95%, it has to be appreciated. The patient has to be motivated to keep it. And then if not, then uh, we need. So sometimes some patients, immediately after first, yes, first month, their adherence doesn't pick up. So repeated counseling may be required. And then finally, the... Ad, uh, adherence of more than 95% can be achieved. So multiple counseling sessions may be required. So patients say, is the alcoholic? Then you have to involve the family. You have to side by side counsel regarding uh, stopping the um, addiction. So all these interventions then is going to lead to proper adherence. And then in, at the end, there is a repeat viral load. Uh, if viral load is less than 1000, uh, Again, uh, it is appreciated that yes, you have achieved that and now you have to maintain it like that. Then your virus, if your virus is suppressed, then your health will remain good. So all that we have to motivate the patient. If now at the end of EAC1, if the viral load is still more than 1000, then um, we have to ask that what was the adherence in all these three sessions. And if we've come across that, yes, in all these three sessions, still the adherence was not more than 95%, then the patient should now again go undergo the second EAC with a different counsellor. And this is the uh, line list of PLHIV with unsuppressed viral load uh, or for susceptible referral. 
the summary. So this has to be generated by every ART center. This has all the details regarding the patient, age, sex, date of the viral, what was the adherence, the dates of the uh, step up counseling, EAC, or date, all the dates have to be mentioned and what was the viral load at the end of the EAC one and the date of referral to SASEP, date of review by SASEP and uh, uh, what was the second uh, SASEP recommendation. So all that needs to be documented. Now, so factors to be assessed before confirming treatment failure. So treatment adherence, as we discussed, so detailed as, uh, assessment of adherence needs to be made. I already show, showed you the different you know, the details protocol, the forms, the reasons for non-adherence need to be explored. So that is the most important. Why there is non-adherence? All those reasons have to be explored. So unless these reasons are identified, a patient will find it difficult to adhere the to the second line regimen. So uh, the, our first line regimen is TLD, which is once a day pill. If the patient is not able to adhere a once daily pill in the first line, how difficult it will be for the patient to adhere to the second line, which has more number of pills. So it's the for most IIT centers, the job is finished. First, when the viral load is high, you do EAC on paper, just write more than 95%. SASEP ko refer kya ho gaya kam. Hamari job dari khatam. And then SASEP is the e SASEP. The SASEP, suppose it advises, the SASEP uh, sees the, the person who sees the SASEP, he is seeing that more than 95 adherence is mentioned on paper by the MO. So they will uh, rely on that and they will change from first line to second line. And the patient just, you know, he's not adherent, he's not adherent on the second line also. And then the whole thing will go to third line. So patient is just from first line to second line to third line. We had such patients of third line failure in our COE where we did genotypic resistance testing. And to our surprise, the most many patients were even sensitive, the virus had sensitive to first line drugs also. So this is where the system, the, there is a problem that it should not be just a formality by the ART center that you refer to SASEP and our job is done. We have to really explore the reasons of non-adherence and address them. Then only we can ensure that we are referring to SASEP only those cases where the viremia or unsuppressed viral load is because of treatment failure. Otherwise, what is happening is 90% of the referrals made to SASEP, there is unsuppressed viral load because of uh, non-adherence. And unfortunately, they are being put from second line and then to third line, so which increases the pill burden, it increases the cost of the treatment, and uh, it is not achieving anything. So this is the most important thing regarding adherence. That is why I'm, uh, I took so much time to uh, again and again, because again and again in my SASEP referrals, I am finding that uh, the main issue is adherence, though it is on paper mentioned as uh, adherence more than 95%. And many times it is not possible for, you know, patients are who are staying far away. So, and when they are coming to COE, it is not possible for actual SASEP. So we have to rely on the ART center when they are providing the uh, uh, EAC results uh, uh, regarding the adherence. So the, again, that is why I am requesting that all medical officers should take active interest. It is not just a job of counselor. The MO has to see whether uh, there are any drug-drug interactions, there are any other issues why the patient is not taking, whether there are any adverse effects or there are some uh, barriers which the patient may be facing. And it is a collective teamwork by the medical officer and the counselor regarding the adherence, uh, dealing with the adherence of the patient. Then coming to drug-drug interactions, assessing whether the patient is concomitantly taking medications that interfere with ARV activity. That is also very important. So we'll be discussing some of those interactions in the later part of this lecture. So um, for example, many patients may not reveal that they take herbal treatments. So they are taking some herbal treatment from some private doctor and they will not re uh, reveal it. And because of those herbal treatments, the, there is drug interaction and so the viral load may be high. Again, certain OIs and occult malignancies may lead to decline in the CD4 count. So suppose now it's a rainy season, patient has a dengue 5 fever. At that time, the CD4 may be high, uh, low. So uh, then uh, during that acute infection, the CD4 may decline. But later on, the CD4 improves. So certain OIs also, again, some, if the patient has some OI, that also can 
lead to a decline in CD4 count, which may revert after treating that OI or viral fever or whatever, or AF, acute febrile illness, and uh, or uh, treating those occult malignancies. Now, again, the flow chart where we, same thing uh, we are discussing just again, just to uh, revise it. Management of PLHI with unsuppressed viral load. So this is the flow chart. So when the viral load test report is available, a line list of PLHIV with unsuppressed viral load should be generated on daily basis. We just now showed you that line list, how it is uh, documented. The list should be shared with the counselor delivering services under package C to telephonically follow up the PLHI with unsuppressed viral load and call them back to ART center. So the counselor will call that uh, patient to the center. Then he, counselor should provide intensive support to improve treatment adherence. So counselor has to give some time. That is the most important. If the counselor finishes the EAC in two minutes, nothing is achieved. So counselor has to sit with these patients. So counselor has to focus on patients with unsuppressed viral load. That is very important. So you should provide that intensive support. A minimum of three sessions, either 15 days or one monthly as needed, are recommended for step up adherence counseling, as we already saw. It is preferred that all counseling sessions are taken by the same counselor because he knows what are the issues. So he acts as a case manager to ensure the consistency, continuity and proper documentation of the issue resolution. And these sessions should be conducted when the patient visits the ART center to collect his or medication. Uh, so that is the EAC1. And counselors should use the ready reckoner as I, we showed that ready reckoner just now and step up counseling form. So it is a beautiful form. So everything is mentioned. So the counselor has just to document systematically in that form what are the issues uh, and go ahead with the uh, pro providing the counseling and how uh, he has to face the, uh, you know, uh, address that barrier. So that whatever the counselor has suggested, that also he has to document in that form. Now, in case the PLHI is not able to come to ART center and is on multi-monthly multi test pension, then three uh, sessions of step-up counseling may be done telephonically with proper documentation in the step-up counseling form. So in that case, if the patient is not coming, he is far away, then telephonically we can do the same counseling and all the documentation in that form. So during step-up counseling, the HIV testing of spouse or partner and children should be facilitated or ensured. Then repeat viral load testing along with other lab investigations must be done once treatment adherence is more than 95% for all three consecutive months. If adherence is less than 95% during the three months, or during the EAC1, then EAC should be repeated by another counselor, that is the EAC2, and viral load to be done at the end of EAC2, irrespective of adherence. Though all efforts should be made to get the appropriate baseline lab tests for switch during the step-up counseling period, Non-availability of these labs or results shouldn't delay the referral. PLHIV who are recommended for change in regimen by, regimen by SASEP should be switched to new regimen as soon as the SASEP recommendations are available. So if viral load count is more than 1000 copies per ml, e-referral to be made to SASEP within two days of receiving the viral load report without waiting for the patient to come. SASEP should review the case and share recommendation with ART center within one week of referral. Simultaneously, patient should be informed to come back to ART center for regimen switch as recommended by SASEP. So till that uh, switch occurs, same regimen has to be continued. So now coming to the uh, SASEP referral. So what is SASEP? It is a state AIDS clinical expert panel. It is uh, uh, situated at the center of excellence or pediatric center of excellence or ART plus centers. So SASEP at center of excellence or PCOE, there's a program director of center of excellence excellence or PS, PCOE. Then there is one more ART expert who is involved in the SASEP from the names provided by NACO and the joint director CST or regional coordinator, coordinator when available or consultant CST at SACS wherever the SASEP is located should also be ideally involved in the SASEP. Then pediatrician from PCOE that he also should be there at the SASEP for the PCOE. Then uh, SASEP at ART plus center the, it should have nodal officer of the ART plus center, then one more ART expert, designated representatives from SACS, DPM, DAPCO, or regional coordinator, coordinator ideally if available, and pediatrician from ART plus center shall be present if there are pediatric patients on that particular day, 
and the SMO and the MO from the ART center should attend the SASEP meeting by rotation. Now, when should a PLHIV be referred to SASEP? Patients for suspected ARV treatment failure, suspected moderate to severe ARV adverse effects. So again, whenever the, there are adherence issues because of ARV adverse effect, a prompt SASEP referral will help because uh, if the patient, if that issue, if that adverse effect is causing the patient's non-adherence, then we cannot just counsel him to take the drug. We have to address that ARV adverse effect, whatever it may be. The SASEP referral of that adverse effect has to be informed the SASEP and then uh, the SASEP will give a decision for deciding for the substitution of one or more ART drugs of a different class. So, uh, addressing the adverse effect promptly is very, very important. Drug-related complications or management of severe OIs, so that cannot be managed at ARST centers. So, again, there these uh, situations have to be referred to uh, SASEP. So, many times uh, we have received such complicated uh, referrals. For example, we get referrals for, say, suspected cases of PML, or disseminated TB where the patient's disease is very poor, uh, then uh, severe drug side effects like uh, AKI because of tenofovir, the patient's serum creatinine is 8 or 9, and such a patient is not now, cannot be managed at ARD center. If you have a rapport and a communication, you have to mark such, patient, such reference as urgent. So this is the system we follow. So any adverse effect, effect which leads to stopping the drug, for example, tenofovir induced AKI, then the, the SASEP referral must be marked urgent so that the COE, uh, concerned COE will immediately address that issue and uh, there can be telephonic communication by the ART center with the concerned person in the COE so that if the patient requests admission, that coordination can happen. So we have such communication. So many times the ART center MO calls me and then I call the patient for admission and we, uh, whatever dialysis or whatever management is required, the patient is admitted at JJ and all the support is done so, so that uh, patient condition will not deteriorate. So any severe complicated OI or any severe drug related complication, there has to be a system where it's not just on paper. Again, SASEP ko refer kiya, kaam hamara job dari khatam. That should not be the attitude. That uh, MO, many uh, medical officers tell me, they, they call me. And they ask me what to do or they say Ki, this is a patient who has having severe issues. And then uh, even from interiors of Maharashtra, we have called the patient and admitted at JJ. And uh, the patient goes home walking. And uh, so both the COE and the concerned ERD center, they have the satisfaction that really this patient uh, management was done nicely. Then patients from private sector on a regimen other than the preferred regimen under NACP can be referred to SASEP after enrollment under care at the ART center. Then mechanism and modalities of uh, SASEP, E-SASEP as I already said, so all the patient treatment details, it is very important that in the E-SASEP, all these details are properly given so that a proper uh, evaluation can be done. So ART history has to be, so we, in our form, we uh, insist on all the date-wise regimen history. So from this date to this date, uh, this was the first line regimen. Then why it was switched, uh, switched or any substitution have happening? What is the reason? So all that is the, the form is there. So that has to be in detail filled with all the viral load test results with date wise and latest and serial CD4 test results date wise. Then treatment adherence details. So many times these forms, everything else is filled, but treatment adherence details are missing or just it is mechanically written as more than 95% without actual adherence evaluation. So that should not happen. And other relevant clinical details have to be shared by the referring ART center. So in the RRF form, that is the referral and reply form. Then review would be conducted in the absence of the patient. So for e-reference, the patient is not required. And with all this uh, data, the review is conducted and the recommendation is shared uh, with the ART center over an email. Then sometimes if the uh, patient is very complicated, the history is not adequate, then post e-referral, uh, procedures, then the ART center and SASEP would virtually connect it. The most easiest thing is we, uh, tele uh, SASEP also we used to conduct, but then coordination, the timing should match of the ART center, all that. So easiest thing for us now is a phone call. So many times my SASEP coordinator or 
myself i call the uh, i tell her to call and connect to the medical officer and we talk and we ask all the cl details clarifications and then we get a review and many times when the adherence we are doubting the adherence uh, we are directly calling we are taking the number of the patient and we are calling up the patient and uh, cross checking that also so uh, what are the benefits suppose on paper now i ask for some information that i want the latest creatinine because regimen involves uh, uh, deciding the dose of lamivudine as per creat clearance and the uh, referral doesn't have a latest creatinine it is one month old creatinine report then we just do a phone call because if i on paper i write a mail and say send the latest creatinine then it is reviewed by the concerned at center and there is a turn around time maybe two weeks also and again there is a delay so to reduce that turn around time uh, the easiest thing is to have communication uh, either through telesusep or through a just a phone call whatever is feasible and easy and it also provides an opportunity for mentoring and capacity building coming to the different treatment regimens now so um, what are the definitions of first line second line and third line art first line art is the initial regimen which is prescribed for an art new patient so the drugs may be of third line also so sometimes a private uh, practitioner he is giving darunavir based uh, regimen to the patient but that will be the first line for this patient so it is the initial regimen prescribed for the art new patient then second line art is the subsequent regimen used in sequence immediately after first line therapy has failed so after first line therapy failed what was the second line uh, reg what was the regimen which was uh, in used in sequence so that is the second line and third line is the subsequent regimen used in sequence immediately after second line therapy has failed so is that, that is the definition then coming to substitution and switch so this uh, you all know already substitution refers to replacement of arv drugs or plho due to adverse effect so you write alternate first line or alternate second line so that means there is a substitution of the drug so the uh, substitution may be because of adverse effect or drug drug interaction or program policy so this does not indicate any change of regimen due to treatment failure whereas switch is the uh, entire uh, complete regimen change and uh, treatment failure refers to the loss of antiviral efficacy to the current regimen and so when the entire regimen is changed due to treatment failure it is referred to as switch now very important thing that if we are there is a substitution now suppose the patient is due for a viral load testing and recently his regimen was changed say um uh, six months back his uh, regimen was changed because of some adverse effect for example tinofovir was changed to abacavir or there was some zirodin anemia so the regimen was changed so in that case uh after so a substitution after six months should be preceded preceded by viral load testing so now the patient is on some uh art and now the substitution is required for the uh art plus center or the sasep then that should be preceded by viral load testing that is important because this helps to understand that whether a single drug substitution is enough for example if the viral load is suppressed then only single drug can be substituted but if the patient has some adverse effects you know for your aki but his viral load is also high then just substituting abacavir for tinofovir will not be enough the whole first line to second line change has to be done because the viral load is high but again why when deciding that we have to ensure that adherence was good because because of the adverse effect sometimes the uh, adherence is not good and that's why the viral load may be high so all those things have to be really properly thoroughly evaluated so for substitution we must ensure that the patient's viral load is suppressed so a single substitution can work that is the gist of the thing now these are the different expected resistance mutations with different arvs you can see on the uh, first column failing arvs and what are the general mutations so for example for zirodin or stavudine plus lamivudine what are the uh, uh, mutations m184v and then success successive nams so these are cumulative the longer one waits to switch the more they accumulate again for uh, combination of zirodine lamivudine and abacavir triple nrti also these mutations will accumulate then come into tinofovir and lamivudine so there is a different mutation either m184v or k65r 
So we, from this, we can one thing we can realize: the patient was on zedovodil, and he has a M one eighty four B mutation. Then still, tinofovir will work because tinofovir has different K sixty five R is required. So uh, whenever patient fails on Z based or zedovodil based uh, regimen, we give tinofovir, and vice versa. Tinofovir based regimen patient is failing, we give zedovodil because the mutations are different. And abacavir with lamivudin. Uh, K sixty five R and M one eighty four R are common with uh, tinofovir. So there are these two mutations are same as for that for tinofovir, but one mutation is different. That is L seventy four V. Then zidovudin or stavudin, TAMS, Q one fifty five M and T sixty nine S. Then tinofovir, abacavir, and tinofovir. This K sixty five R. For DTG again, different mutations are there. R twenty six three K G one one eight R and so on. Atazanavir one fifty L one eighty four V so on. Dopinavir, Aritonavir again different sets of mutations and DR uh, Darunavir Aritonavir there are different sets of mutations. Coming to second line regimens for patients failing PLHIV failing on first line. So just if we understand this basic these uh, flow charts, then it becomes very easy. And you will realize that why it is important to send a hemoglobin report when you are sending doing a referral. Many times hemoglobin report is not there, creatinine is not there. So in the second line, when we are using, we I want to use zidovudin based regimen for second line. If the hemoglobin report is only not sent by the center, then again we have to uh, go back to that ART center, ask for again. So delay. There is a delay in the. uh switching of the regimen so that is why if you understand this concepts then you will uh, also do proper sasep preferences so now coming to the failing first line art regimen so if it is a tinofovir abacavir containing regimen and uh, the nrti is either tinofovir or abacavir and uh, the third drug is the insti based first line art that is dolutegravir so suppose the patient is on tld as the first line So what will be the second line regimen? So now, as as we said, if tinofovir is patient is failing on tinofovir, we have to use zidovudin. So that's why we should have a baseline hemoglobin. So if the baseline hemoglobin is more than nine, then the patient will be on the a different NRTI, a different NRTI. So ZL, so ZL BD and atazanavir or ritonavir combination. So so this is a PI group. So patient is Failing on insti group, that is dolutegravir. So we are giving second line regimen with PI. So the regimen will be ZL with ATVR. Now suppose in this patient the hemoglobin is less than nine, or there was past history of severe zidovudin induced anemia, then in that case the second line regimen will be DTG fifty mg BD. Why DTG fifty mg BD? Because the patient has failed on A DTG based ART. So whenever a patient fails on DTG based ART, the next regimen, second or third line, will be BD dose of DTG. So DTG fifty mg BD with atazanavir, ritonavir as the PI, and plus existing NRTI backbone, which was say TL. So practically, how will be prescribed? So it will be say TLD with additional DTG. So TLD. Plus a DTG additional with ATVR, so that will be the final regimen. Then, if the patient is say on zidovudin containing uh, insti based first line ART, that is ZLD regimen. So, for example, the patient was started on ZLD in the private, and now his first line was ZLD. So, what will be the second line ART regimen? So, now we have to have a different NRTI that is TL. So, TL plus ATVR. So, here we have to ensure that the creatinine is baseline creatinine is normal. so we can safely give tinofovir so in, if there is a uh, issue of creatinine that we cannot give tinofovir then here we have to give abacavir so abacavir with lamivudin and atb now coming to second line regimens for plhiv failing on first line different uh, not the dtg based regimen either the nnrti or pi based regimens so if we have a patient who was on tinofovir or abacavir containing nnrti based first line regimen so that means either tle or abacavir lamivudin if awareness what will be the second line so again because tl was used now we have to use zidovudin so we need hemoglobin so hemoglobin more than 9 g 
it will be zl d so here dtg will now be in the second line because the first line was nnrti so zl d will be the second line in this case however if the hb is less than 9 and we cannot use zidodin then the patient will be on atvr with dtg so here dtg uh, patient did not was not exposed to dtg in the first line it was nnrti based so dtg is od so dtg plus atazanavir ritonavir with the existing nrti backbone so that means patient was say on tenofovir so, so tl d plus atvr so tld one pill and atazanavir ritonavir uh, one od pill so that will be the final regimen now suppose the patient was on pi based first line art so for example patient was on tl atvr as the first line so if the hb is more than 9 patient will be on zld as the second line so zlbd and dtg od however if hb is less than 9 and patient was on tl atvr so now the patient was already exposed to atazanavir as the first line art so now you will have to use darunavir based so dtg with darunavir ritonavir dtg is 50 mg od only because patient was never exposed to dtg in the first line so dtg 50 mg od dr vr bd that is darunavir 600 bd with ritonavir 100 mg bd and the existing nrti backbone so again say existing nrti backbone was here either tenofovir lamivudin or abacavir lamivudin so final regimen will be tld od with additional dtg 50 mg od with dr vr bd now if the patient was zidodin containing um uh, uh, regimen with nnrti or pi based first line so now the second line will have tl so zl e second line will be tld if the patient was on zl atvr then um, again patient will be on tld as the second line so either zl e or zl atvr second line will be tld however if the patient has contraindication to tenofovir then we have to give abacavir lamivudin and dtg for example if the creatinine is high and you cannot use tenofovir then the patient will be on abacavir lamivudin dtg now if the failing first line art regimen the patient had was exposed to multiple nrti so suppose the susep we have susep reference where the patient has been nrti for long period maybe stavudine initially then uh, zidodine or tenofovir so long exposure of multi multiple nrtis in that case so this is the nn nnrti based first line regimen so say say first zln or first sln then zln then tle in that case what will be the second uh, line regimen you cannot use any new nrti all the nrtis are exposed so here it will be dtg 50 mg od atvr plus existing nrti backbone so uh, whatever existing uh, suppose the patient is now on tle so tld with atvr that will be the second line regimen and if the patient was multi nrti exposed with pi based first line art then in the second line we will have to use darunavir ritonavir with dtg od and the existing nrti backbone now any plhiv co infected with tb and on rifampicin based treatment receives bd dose of dtg until 2 weeks after the completion of akt and subsequent od dose is continued any plhiv co infected with hepatitis b will receive tl so the tenofovir has to be there in the second line regimen we do retain that if if already the patient is not receiving uh, entecovir if the patient is on entecovir then we need not continue tl in the second line or third line for those with hiv 2 or hiv 1 and 2 uh, infection so hiv 2 or hiv 2 1 plus 2 or pregnant women and toxicity to atazanavir ritonavir we have to use lopinavir instead of atazanavir so lopinavir there are two three scenarios where we will be we will be using one is hiv 2 or hiv 1 plus 2 and pregnancy and one more scenario patient if is having creatinine high then atazanavir ritonavir is nephrotoxic so ideally we should use lopinavir in that situation so any an nrti backbone when we are using if it is contraindicated for example tenofovir uh, nephrotoxicity then you use another like zl or abac so now we will consider the recommended third line art regimens for plhiv so we'll just see the various scenarios so the first scenario is plhiv who failed on 
2 NRTI plus DTG as first line and now failing on PI base second line. So the first uh, first line which uh, patient failed on was if say TLD, then the second line if the HB was more than 9 would have been ZL TVR. And in that case, the third line will be DTG 50 MGPD plus DRVR BD and existing NRTI backbone that is ZL. However, if the patient was on TLDS first line and his HB was less than 9 at the time of second line, then the second line would be uh, DTG 50 MGPD and uh, existing NRTI with ATVR or LPVR and existing NRTI backbone that is TLD. TL. So it will be TLD plus DTG plus ATVR as second line. And even in the same, even in this scenario, the third line here again will be DTG 50 MG PD with TRVR PD with existing NRTI backbone that is TL. So uh, here in the third line, uh, in both scenarios, uh, for the failing second line, whether the HB was more than 9 or HB was less than 9, because the patient had DTG in the first line, then here third line, the DTG will be 50 mg PD. So that is the thing. Now coming to PLHIV who failed on 2 NRTIs plus NNRTIs first line and now failing on PI base second line. So the failed first line was uh, any of the NRTIs like Zidovudine, Stavudine, Tinofor or Abakavir plus Lamivudine and uh, either Nevirapine or Ifavarins as the failed first line. So in that case, second line would have been uh, the NRTI backbone with ATVR or LPVR. That was the PI base failing second line. So in that case, here the third line will be DTG OD because the patient has never till now been exposed to Dolutagravir. So DTG OD plus DRVR PD with the existing NRTI backbone. Then the third scenario, PLHIV who failed on 2 NRTI plus NNRTI as first line and now failing on INST based that is DTG based second line. So here the failing first line was uh, any of the NRTIs plus lamivudine with nevirapine or ifavarens and the second line was uh, NRTI backbone with DTG. For example, the patient was on first line TLE and the second line was ZLT. So in this case, the third line will be DTG 50 mg PD with DRVR PD with existing NRTI backbone. So here the patient was exposed to dolutagravir in the second line and so in the third line, the DTG dose is PD. Next slide. Then coming to the next scenario, PLHIV who failed on 2 NRTIs plus PI as first line and now failing on INSTI based second line. So the patient had PI based first line that is any of the NRTIs with lamivudine with ATVR or LPVR and this patient uh, when failed on first line was given INSTI based second line. So uh, a different uh, NRTI with lamivudine plus DTG. So here also the recommendation for third line will be DTG 50 mg PD because the patient was exposed to DTG in the second line. So DTG 50 mg PD with DRBR PD plus existing NRTI backbone. Then the next scenario is the PLHIV who failed on two NRTIs plus PIS first line and now failing on NN NNRTI based second line. So patient was given uh, any of the NRTIs with lamivudine with ATV or LPR as first line and a second line here was a uh, NNRTI based second line. So for example, patient would have been on TL ATVR as the first line and then the second line would be ZLE. So here in the third line, it will be DRVR BD plus DTG OD because patient has never been exposed to INST or DTG till now. So DTG dose is OD in third line with the existing NRTI backbone. And then we have a scenario where a PLHI failed on two NRTI plus PIS first line and now failing on DRVR based second line. So 
patient was given uh, NRTI backbone with ATVR or LPVR as first line. And second line was, uh, again, the same NRTI backbone, uh, different class NRTI, and then TRVR BD in the second line. And the third line here will be an addition of DTG as OD dose with uh, DRVR beading and the existing NRTI backbone. Now, if there is any time a contraindication for a particular NRTI, like patient's existing NRTI backbone was say ZDOD, and now uh, while we are switching to the third line, uh, there is an anemia noted. So then instead of ZDOD, we can give tenofovir. Or if the patient was on uh, tenofovir and while uh, switching to third line, uh, the creatinine is raised, then instead of tenofovir, we can give abacavir. So whenever there is a contraindication for any NRTI backbone because of any adverse effects, another NRTI backbone can be given instead. Also, whenever there is a, a hepatitis B co-infection, we maintain a tenofovir lamudin as the NRTI uh, backbone if the patient is not already receiving entecavir. If the patient is already on entecavir, then we may not give TN. Next slide. So this is just a bird's eye view, whatever we discussed. Uh, there are six scenarios. So scenario one, failed on DTG-based first line. And the second line was uh, PI based, uh, either uh, if a patient failing say on TLD, the second line would have been ZL ATVR or TLD ATVR with DTG additional dose if the hemoglobin is low. So these are where the two scenarios we saw where the patient uh, in which, I mean the two second line scenarios. And in both these cases, the third line recommended will be DTG 50 mg BD with DRVR BD with existing back, uh, NRTI backbone. Scenario 2 failing on a NNRTI based first line that is <clears throat> any of the NRTIs, Zidudin, Stavudin, Tinofovir, Abakavir with Lamudin with Nevirapine or Efavirenz as the first line. The second line will be PI based here. If the uh, uh, So a different NRTI combination with ATVR or LPVR and third line will be here in this case DTG in OD dose with DRVR BD with existing NRTI backbone. Third scenario patient on again an NRTI based first line. The second line here was DTG based a different class NRTI with DTG as the second line and here the third line will be DTG BD dose as the patient is already exposed to DTG in the second line. So DTG 50 mg BD with DRVR BD with existing NRTI backbone. Fourth scenario, PI based first line with second line, DTG based second line. Here again, third line will be DTG 50 BD with DRVR BD and existing NRTI backbone. Fifth scenario, PI based first line with NNRTI based second line. Again, patient was not exposed to INSTI in any of these first or second line. So here the third line has DTG OD with DRVR BD and existing NRTI backbone. And the last scenario, PI based first line with Darunavir, Ratonavir based second line. Here the third line is again DTG OD with DRVR BD and existing NRTI backbone. So that is the uh, completes our uh, third line guidelines. Next slide, please. So, NASEP, it is a, a mechanism to respond to queries raised by SASEP of COE and ART plus centers, and the function is coordinated by NACO through e consultations. Next slide. So, coming to monitoring of patients on second line. Uh, all patients on second line ART, as we said, undergo viral load testing every six months and the viral load algorithm shall be followed based on the result as we did discuss in detail. Patients with unsuppressed viral load should undergo enhanced adherence counseling. 
and once optimum adherence achieved for three consecutive months, repeat viral load testing should be done as we already discussed. Next slide. Workup of patients with suspected uh, second line failure. Just I'll need five minutes for more. Uh, good adherence. So uh, these are referred to SUSEP or ART plus. Poor adherence. We have to do steps to improve adherence, close monitoring. And if no improvement is seen after three months, it should be again referred to COE or ART plus. And the prescription of third line will be now, as you all already know, after the SUSEP has reviewed the patient and prescribed third line uh, ART, initiation and follow-up dispensions would be done by the parent ART centers as everyone is doing. So henceforth, there is no transfer out for initiation of that. We are, that is already implemented and it has taken place. Next slide. So monitoring of patients on second line or third line, so we have to do HBCBC first every monthly till third, three months and then six monthly. LFT, baseline, then at three months and then six monthly. Renal function test, again baseline at three months and six monthly. Again, many times we see white cards of patients and patient directly comes with creatinine in five, six the renal function is not monitored as per the protocol. So please, again, it is a sincere request that this, all these things has to be documented properly in the white card and it has to be done as per this. Otherwise, we will, patient will have irreversible toxicity. Patient will, many patients will fail, uh, will have AKI, which is converted into CKD because six monthly creatinine was not done. And directly it is discovered very late. So very important renal function test baseline three months and every six months. Passing sugar first as beta baseline and then yearly. Then lipid profile again at baseline at 12 months and yearly. Viral load for baseline. Uh, viral load we don't do at baseline. It is at six months and then one yearly. CD4 count uh, baseline six months and then one yearly. Next slide. So timing, we have already discussed this. So can just skip this slide. Next slide, please. Uh, in this, just we have to remember CD4 monitoring should be restarted if any patient has an unsuppressed viral load. Now coming with uh, HIV TB co-infection, uh, all the questions I'll just take at the end of this presentation. TB is the most common OI. So most important, any patient on rifampicin based AKT ATT, he receives BT dose of DTG until two weeks after the completion of anti-TB treatment. So once the TB treatment is stopped, after two weeks, we will make the DTG as OD dose. Next step. Coming to HIV TB in patients with PI based regimen. So uh, ideally, we, uh, it's recommended that we give rifabutin for patients who are on PI based uh, or uh, either atazanavir, lopinavir or dironavir. So rifabutin in the dosage of 150 mg OD has to be given for a patient with weight more than 30 kg. Next slide. Uh, so, sorry, ma please give me two minutes, ma'am. Yeah. Is the screen visible? Oh, ma'am, please continue. Huh. So, um, when we are uh, having TB with uh, PI-based second line or third line regimens, that time, as we said, because there is a enzyme induction by rifab uh, rifampicin, the, the PI levels are reduced. And that's why we switch to rifabutin because rifabutin does not have this enzyme induction. However, uh, the side effects of uh, rifabutin are similar to rifampicin. So patient may have a brown uh, or orange uh, urine and patient may have other adverse effects like muscle aches, uh, flu-like syndrome, fatigue, sore throat, etc. Similar to uh, uh, rifampicin. But now uh, the practical uh, problem is many centers, the uh, rifabutin is still not available. So uh, the TRG at NACO has recommended that levofloxacin has to be used instead of rifampicin along with uh, PI-based regimens. So, uh, 
basically when we give leofloxacin regimen it has to be given a bit longer because the regimen is now weakened as rifampicin is a uh, stronger drug and now we are substituting leofloxacin so the uh, for the initial regimen uh, should be the four drug regimen it intensive regimen has to be three months when it is leofloxacin ideally and then followed by six months of maintenance regimen so slightly longer duration instead of the usual six months uh, duration of tb drugs we give leofloxacin based for a longer duration so as to prevent resistance so three months of intensive phase followed by six months of uh, maintenance phase so instead of hre in the maintenance uh, we give INH, leofloxacin and ethambutal for six months further. So that is a um, another thing. Next slide. So the uh, side effect profiles of uh, all the drugs. So for tenofovir, most important serious side effect is kidney failure and pancreatitis. How will we identify that? Patient generally comes with nausea, vomiting, anorexia. So initially just patient says I'm having anorexia or vomiting. So in that case, the patient can may stop the drug. So it is not because the adherence here, adherence issue is not because of the any other problem. It is because of the adverse effect. So any patient who is on tenofovir, who says vomiting, nausea, please do a prompt serum creatinine and identify whether it is. So this early identification and prompt changing the drug will save the patient from later on severe AKI, dialysis and other adverse effects. It's a very, very important thing. And we see many such patients which are missed initially at the ART center and then patient goes into frank kidney failure and requ may require even, you know, creatinine jumps up to 6 or 10 also. So very important. Any patient on tenofovir says vomiting, no, uh, which is of new onset, anorexia, nausea, please look for these two things, either AKI or pancreas. Pancreatitis. If the patient says pain in abdomen, it may be pancreatitis. So you can do a serum amylase level and a USG abdomen. And what is the management? We have to do a re referral to SUSEP and the drug will be changed to Abacavir based. Then uh, tenofovir also can cause bone toxicity and sometimes AV necrosis, hip AV necrosis. So they are also SUSEP referral for changing the regimen. Dolutagravir is usually well tolerated. There can be serious effects like Severe insomnia. Now, if the insomnia is so severe that patient is not taking the tablet, then in that case, it needs to be changed. Otherwise, initially, you can just counsel and address the issue. Then there can be depression, suicidal ideation. There can be weight gain. There can be hepatotoxicity. But before you label as any patient with DTG hepatotoxicity, you have to rule out other causes like TB hepatotoxicity or uh, other um, hepatitis B, hepatitis C infections and so on. There is a potential for a very small potential for increased risk of neural tube defects, but that is much less uh, as previously thought of. So we need to take an informed consent from women in the reproductive age group. And uh, if there are any side effects like rash or hepatotoxicity, we have to do SUSEP referral. Next slide. Then coming to etazanavir. Etazanavir will cause indirect hyperbilirubinia. So it is just like a Gilbert-like syndrome. So just the indirect bilirubin rises. So this is a cosmetic problem. So many times we see bilirubin is 5 or 6, but SGPT and SGOT are absolutely normal. So we have to ensure that the liver enzymes are normal. And only for indirect hyperbilirubinemia, we need not change the regimen. We have to counsel the patient. And it is very important drug interaction with atazanavir. You cannot give, it requires acidic, um, medium for absorption. So not to give concomitant antacids or H2 receptor uh, antagonists or proton pump inhibitors. There has to be a gap of at least two for more than two hours uh, with these drugs when we are giving atazanavir. That is the most important thing we must remember. Next slide. Then for lopinavir, there can be GI intolerance like diarrhea. So lopinavir induced diarrhea is the most important significant side effects. Again, uh, patients on lopinavir should be monitored for possible liver problems. And people who have liver disease such as hepatitis B or hepatitis C may experience a worsening of their liver condition. So, um, only thing, 
as compared with atazanavir, lopinavir has the minimum hepatotoxicity. Then darunavir can come with skin rash and other adverse effects can be hepatotoxicity, uh, GI intolerance, transaminase elevation, hyperglycemia and fat maldistribution. And management is symptomatic management of the minor ones. If there is rash, you can do SASAI preferral. And we need to monitor LFTs and lipid profile. Next slide. So, atanazanavir induced unconjugated hyperbilirubina. As we said, the decision of whether to discontinue the offending uh, PI, that is ATVR, usually depends on how severe and noticeable the jaundice is and whether the patient is willing to tolerate it. Sometimes, we counsel the patient, but the patient is not willing. He has this cosmetic effect. And if he is not willing to take the drug, then we can do a SASA preferral. And, uh, but first, we do need to counsel that it is harmless and it is just a cosmetic thing. And uh, we have to ensure the patient that liver damage is not occurring. Then many patients do continue the uh, same treatment. So alternative regimen is necessary only for patients who develop an unacceptable level of jaundice with three hypertoxicity. That is very high liver enzyme levels, five to times upper limit of normal or more than 10 times elevation of ALT and AST. Next slide. Next slide. So we'll just keep that because the child book scoring and all. So this scoring is done to grade the hypertoxicity. So we can give um, atazanavir only in patient who is in child's book score 1. A. So, for that scoring, for calculating the child book score, this whole table is there. And uh, finally, with all these points, we calculate whether the next slide, please. Patient falls in, uh, these are the encephalopathy grades, how to calculate that. And according to that, we find out the child book scoring. And only child book category A will be given atazanavir, ritonavir. Next slide. So, that's what class A child book. Only these patients can be given ATVR. If the patient has hepatotoxic or is having underlying liver disease with child book classification of B or C, then uh, patient this patient cannot be given atazanavir right now. Next slide. So drug-drug interaction for dotor DTG, most important, we should find out if their patient is on any antacids. And if the patient is on, then DTG has to be given at least two hours before or six hours after antacids that contain aluminum or magnesium or calcium. Then polyvalent cation supplements, many times patient takes multivitamin and they have all this calcium, zinc, iron. So again, this should not be given together. These supplements, they cannot be given along with DTG. So there has to be a gap of at least two hours uh, before or at least six hours after the supplement. So DTG should be given. So if the patient is taking that multivitamin pill in the afternoon, at least six hours have to be passed. So DTG will be in the evening. So like that. Then rifampicin, as we already discussed, there is an interaction. So DTG 50 mg BD, always with rifampicin. Similarly, if the patient is in uh, seizure disorder case, then carbamamacin, that can co decrease the concentration of DTG. So either we have to change the anticonvulsant or then increase the DTG dose to 50 mg BD. Metformin also, DTG increases concentration of metformin. So, maximum dose of metformin when a patient is on DTG-based regimen should not exceed 1 gram per day and uh, metformin metformin has to be started on the lowest dose and titrated based on glycemic control. Next slide. Next slide. So, all PIs, major drug-drug interactions. So, we should not use astemizole, cisapride, fluticosone, indanavir, Simvastatin, midazolone, and terfenadine. Rifampicin already we discussed. We must give either leofloxacin or use rifampicin. Atorostatin should uh, increase concentration of atorostatin is possible. So we have to give the lowest effective doses. Next slide. Next slide, please. So we already discussed this. Next slide. Next slide. So now we come to the key points. So viral load as the preferred approach for monitoring PLHIV on ART over 
technological CD4 and clinical monitoring here is vital in preserving the second line options. Clinical and CD4, that is immunological monitoring, is essential for HIV 2 PLA, PLHIV. Importance of adherence to second and third line ART should be reiterated every visit for pill pickup. And second line and third line ART regimens need to be initiated after SASEP review. So, thank you. Uh, just whatever the questions are there. Yes, thank you so much, ma'am. Give me two minutes to collate the questions, ma'am. Uh, yeah. Just yeah. two minutes. Oh, ma'am, I've put the questions in the PPT. Yeah. So, if a patient is virally suppressed on third line... I'll read the questions, ma'am. If a patient is virally suppressed on third line ART for three years, can we still perform a drug-resistant test with the possibility of moving to first line ART? we can yes based on that report we can uh, move to first line ART because in that scenario for that patient it must have been that the uh, switching took place because of uh, viremia unsuppressed viremia because of non-adherence so he may be not be drug resistant and then such a test will reveal that so in that it is possible so we can we should be moving to first line then second line patient is Oh, ma'am, the DTGBD. Yes. So I didn't understand this question. Yeah. Second yeah. line suddenly is BD. Take that question for now, ma'am. I'll take the third question. Yeah. Why darunavir so, plus ritonavir is contraindicated in pregnancy? No, darunavir ritonavir is not. It's atazanavir ritonavir we avoid in pregnancy uh, because of some uh, because uh, it has some adverse issues. So in pregnancy we are giving lopinavir ritonavir instead of uh, atazanavir ritonavir. And darunavir ratonavir is not contraindicated in my pregnancy as far my as my knowledge goes. Now, if the patient yeah. is HBSSG positive and has deranged RFT and needs to be substituted to abacavir, what is done to be to tinofovir cannot be given. Yes. So for that, there are two options. One is entecavir or tinofovir alafenamide. Now, these are not available in the program as of now, but uh, you can con con contact once the SASEP advises the patient may be referred to uh, centers for hepatitis B management. So there are national centers which uh, give free treatment for hepatitis B. So if uh, such a center is available nearby, patient may be referred to such a center for entacavir or tinofovir alafenamide or the patient has to be prescribed and then the local uh, uh, regional uh, SACs or DACs, whatever, they may help in uh, procuring the drug for that patient. Uh, why is super boosting with ritonavir for PI based regimens along with rifamycin not preferred? Yes. The super boosting, when we uh, actually implemented for a few patients, it was found that because of the pill burden and plus because of the super boosted doses of PIs, many patients had severe toxicity. There is complete intolerance. Whatever, whenever we had tried the super boosting, there was a lot of um, a patient uh, intolerance. So many drugs and patient had severe gastritis. So this is much more easier. However, there is a concern for resistance. So when the patient had multiple, suppose such a patient, now we are about to give levofloxacin. In, suppose such a patient has past history of multiple times TB. Then in that case, uh, there, there is an issue of possible resistance. So you can refer to a center of excellence in TB along with, or you can ask your 
COE concerned COE to take an opinion from TB specialist and then a, a regimen can be derived in that case. Then next question is, uh, case one, can we continue tenofovir in patients with past history of septic shock with AKI? Suppose the patient had AKI because of septic shock and then patient's RFTs are completely normal and uh, now the kidney function is absolutely normal. We can give tenofovir in such a patient. We can try. But we should be like here it was because of septic shock and not because of tenofovir nephrotoxicity. So in such a patient, when now we are rechallenging tenofovir, we have to monitor the creatinine, say weekly. So just to be sure that patient does not have any renal issues now. So you are monitoring weekly or say twice weekly or initially monthly maybe, whatever. The patient has to tell, be told that you have to follow up with creatinine reports. So at least twice weekly, and you, you are monitored serially now, and you know now for the next three months, uh, patient's creatinine is normal, then tenofovir can be safely continued in that case. And uh, we know that the AKI was because of the septic shock, so now patient is tolerating tenofovir. Next question is, can we increase dose of lamiudine uh, previously reduced due to reduced creatinine clearance with improvement? Yes, yes. So that is why it is very important. So many times patient have tenofovir AKI, so that time, the dose of lamivudine is adjusted as per the clearance. But once the tenofovir is stopped and the creatinine normalizes, then you can go back to the dose of normal uh, dose of lamivudine. Full dose will be possible if the creatinine clearance is improving after more than 30 ml per minute. Or if the creatinine is slightly improved, not completely, then you can do increase. Suppose uh, creatinine was very low initially, then we uh, very high initially, we gave a dose of 50 mg OD of lamivudine. But now creatinine is improved and now the creatinine clearance is improved. We can increase from 50 mg OD to 100 mg OD depending on the creatinine clearance. Next uh, question is, is there a possibility of bring, bringing injection cabitegravir with <laughs> real primary into our program? So that I am not the suitable person to answer that. That uh, NACO uh, people will be able to answer whether it is possible or no. So I am not the person can answer this. Uh, virological you. failure with previous exposed tenofovir, lambudin, DTG, it has oh, what again it has gone. Any yeah, ma'am, I have questions? pasted I'll it. Just see the chat. I have box. pasted it, ma'am. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Oh, the last uh, question. If a patient is virally suppressed on third line ART, yeah, that's already done. Okay. Next, virological failure with previous exposed tenofovir, lamudin, DTG, AZT. Yeah. Uh, is the screen visible, ma'am? In second line, if substitution of medication needed, then should we go viral load testing before substitution? Yes, yes. Again, we should go for viral load before substitution. Whatever the line, it is better to do the viral load because substitution with single drug will not be uh, advisable in case the viral load is high. We have to have a complete switch. So first line also it is advisable, second line also. Uh, virological failure with previous exposed to nofor, lambudin, DTG, uh, zedoodine, stavudine, lopinavir, ritonavir. So such a patient will be on the third line, existing NRTI backbone, whatever we can give. DTG will be BD. So, NRTI backbone, DTG BD and Darunavir, Ritonavir. That will be the third line for this patient or whatever line. I think that answers all questions. Yeah. Yes, all questions covered, ma'am. Uh, Kameshwari, ma'am, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Your question was not clear. Else, you can send me a WhatsApp and I'll forward the question to uh, ma'am and uh, request her to answer it for you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for this session, for the important yeah, session. You. And sorry, it was a bit lengthy. Uh, you had to talk no, non-stop. Yeah, it was lengthy. By us. Thank you to all the participants for patient listening. Yeah, I'm very grateful for everybody for uh, patiently listening, though it exceeded the time limit. And I'm sorry for that. No, no, no issues, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. We'll Thank continue you. the session now. Yeah.